Hi, I'm Gary Conley. Today we'll be demonstrating the field methodologies used to develop the habitat characterization that we employed for the Department of Energy's ports facility in Piketon, Ohio. In order to characterize the habitats uh, that exist within a study area, we wanted to capture vegetation plots. Uh, in this instance, we're actually using circular 10 meter radius uh, vegetation plots, which will capture the, the trees, uh, shrubs and vegetation layer, as well as characterizing the, the soil and any habitat features that might be encountered. In order to do that, we establish a single point which will become the center of our vegetation plot, uh, which is uh, indicated by the, the pole um, that we establish in the center. It has uh, blue and red tape on it in which we use a forester's prism in a non-traditional sense to overlap the two colors until we are exactly 10 meters away from the center. Circular plots are certainly much easier to set up than square plots and much easier to replicate when you are out in the field. Uh, if we were to do long-term studies of a study area, uh, you would want that consistency in quantitative measures. Uh, here today we're going to measure the uh, primarily the vegetation component of the ecosystem, starting with the, the trees, the forest canopy, the shrub layer, and the vegetation layer. Then we'll take a look at the uh, soils and habitat features that might exist here on the site as well. Now that we've established our plot perimeter, we're going to measure the, the DBH or diameter at breast height of each of the trees located within the perimeter of the, the study plot. Uh, this is a sugar maple, which is exactly what you'd expect to find on a mesic slope. The DBH is taken at breast height from the lowest side of the tree. And we're at 17.8 inches. This, this sugar maple is 17.8 inches in diameter. This is a special tape designed specifically to measure the diameter of each of the trees. I certainly wouldn't measure linear measurements with this. Once the size of all the trees has been measured, we want to get some idea as to when the trees began to grow here and what the growth rate might be. Uh, one of the ways to accomplish that is to take a, a core from, from uh, a sample of the trees. Um, in this instance, we're choosing a white pine. Uh, this was a, clearly a planted pine, and we can get some idea of when this pine was planted and how quickly it grew in competition with the other species. Uh, in order to do that, we've chosen uh, a tree bore, which we'll drill into the tree and try to hit the center of the tree so that we, we can establish a time in which this tree began to grow. Going in nicely now. Tightening up. Now I'd say we've we've hit the center here. <clears throat> Once the center is reached, the bore is backed out one full turn. The spoon is inserted down the shaft. And hopefully the core is removed. Not always so easy. And there we are. So once the core was taken from the tree, uh, we did hit the center and I can roughly count the rings uh, using my hand lens. And I've counted about 55 or 60 rings here. So these, these white pines were planted about 55 or 60 years ago. And I do notice that there are periods where the, the tree was growing faster uh, at times and slower at times uh, based on the width of those rings. Of course, the tree grows, as it grows faster, the rings are wider and they're much more narrow in, in years where they're, it's growing slower. Uh, this could indicate differences in competition or light availability. Once all the tree measurements are made and a couple of cores taken, uh, it's time to measure the shrub layer 
The shrub layer consists of anything that's taller than my knee and less than one inch DBH. Um, in this case, we've got a patch of pawpaws growing. Uh, they're all fairly small due to a new forest gap that's opened up um, as that white pine has recently fallen. In order to measure the shrub layer, we use a caliper and essentially measure the base of each of the shrubs within our sample plot. Uh, in this case, this pawpaw is about half an inch in diameter, which is about the average size of most of the pawpaws in this patch. The other shrubs in this layer would consist of small beech trees, other small maple trees, and a handful of oak trees. The lowest layer of vegetation uh, is the herb layer, and that consists of anything uh, less than uh, one and a half feet tall, and, uh, and is typically composed of herbaceous species. Um, we do have a, a number of woody species that are incorporated in the vegetation layer quite often. Uh, and in this case, we have some, uh, some raspberries and blackberries, uh, the Rubus genus. Uh, but for the most part, we, we do see uh, herbaceous species. Uh, we have a wild yam and some Christmas ferns here, uh, comprising a large portion of the, the sample. And we also have some Carex species. Uh, the sample is a one meter, one square meter uh, sample area that we randomly throw out in all four quadrants of the vegetation plot. All of the species within that one meter hoop are identified and um, quantified in the terms of the vegetation cover within that circle. The total vegetation for the, the sample is also noted on the field sheets and any species or samples that can't be identified two species are collected and placed in a bag uh, with what we call a voucher. Quite often grasses and sedges can't be identified to species in the field so they're commonly collected and in this case we do have a grass species. Uh, we'll just take the above ground vegetation and we'll go in, uh, into a bag to be put under a microscope and uh, looked at more closely uh, to identify it to the individual species if possible. Quite often carexes and grasses require that the plant be in fruit uh, or in bloom in order to recognize all the pertinent features of the, the, the plant itself to identify two species. So quite commonly you'll have vegetation within each of the samples that can't be identified two species at that particular time of year. So to comprehensively characterize vegetation uh, of any sample, uh, it's best to collect at multiple times of year. And on the ports facility, uh, we visited both in the spring and the fall to almost all of our vegetation plots uh, to most comprehensively characterize the vegetation that was there. This is a pretty typical vegetation cover for a mesic slope. Uh, we have some jewel weed uh, incorporated in with, uh, with our sample here, uh, indicating that there, there's some soil moisture. And, um, and a lot of the pine needles created sort of an acid, acid condition to the soil. Uh, so you have some, some more acid loving species here as well. Once the vegetation is characterized, the tree layer, the shrub layer, the herb layer. Uh, we look for opportunities for uh, wildlife to utilize the habitat. So we look for habitat features such as uh, the number of holes in, in standing trees, um, cavities in which uh, birds could make nests or small mammals. Uh, we also look for trees that have loose attached bark such as a shagbark hickory or a sycamore tree uh, provide opportunities for bats to, to find habitat. Um, we also look for rocky holes and, um, uh, and crevices in the ground uh, for, for ground, ground nesting species and, and perhaps amphibians and reptiles. Uh, we look for any light soil with burrows, uh, indicating that perhaps small mammals uh, have an opportunity to, to dwell in the subsurface, um, as well as raptor perches. 
Uh, these would be opportunities in the upper part of the canopy uh, in which uh, a, a raptor could land, uh, such as a hawk, um, could land and, and observe the habitat uh, and wait for uh, feeding opportunities on the forest floor. Uh, these are all elements that, that play into the functionality and uh, uh, complexity of each of these ecosystem habitats. And finally, to characterize the habitat here, we capture some of the physical features of the, the study plot itself. Uh, in this case, we um, will be pulling a soil sample but using a 12-inch soil probe. Simply inserted and pulled out, we end up with a very nice cross-section of the soil underneath our feet here. So the soil sample that we just pulled from this particular location uh, includes a very sandy soil. Um, we're high up on the slope and uh, pretty indicative of weathering sandstones. A lot of the outcroppings here are shale and sandstones and we see this sand accumulation from, from that, uh, that weathering process over, over ages. Uh, but we also see here on the top a, uh, an organic horizon uh, which is an accumulation of all the organic material that's been falling you know, on the forest floor here, uh, such as leaves and twigs, uh, and of course rotting carcasses perhaps. Um, that organic horizon then decays down to um, the uppermost horizons where the roots of all the plants and trees are located, and further down into a, uh, a B or subsoil horizon. Uh, in this case, you know, consisting of a large part, portion of sand, but a fair amount of silt as well. Now that soil, soil type could vary pretty dramatically from, from location to location throughout even the sample plot. So a lot of times we'll take a couple of sample um, soil samples from around the plot if we do think there's some diversity there. Um, in order to, to finally characterize uh, the plot itself, um, actually take a slope and an aspect, uh, it'd help us to characterize the, the physical state of the, the plot as well. Um, in this case, uh, we're on a north facing slope and there's a clinometer uh, feature on this particular compass in which we can identify the angle of slope, in this case about 15 degrees. All of this data collected helps us to formally characterize this habitat physically and vegetatively, uh, produces a, a data set with many attributes that can be uh, queried in a number of ways to, to one map the, the different types of habitats that can be found in a study area, but also to determine what species might be occurring here, uh, to analyze that data spatially and ask a number of questions of that data for years to come. Uh, it can also provide a baseline data for determining the long-term changes of that ecosystem and the uh, overall impacts to disturb disturbances of various kinds. In the face of climate change, it's quite valuable to collect as much of that data now uh, to determine how that might impact uh, our forests and ecosystems uh, in the long term.